to the to the next. Yeah, we have to move to the next speaker. That is, that is Werner Poeve from Universitat Innsbruck. He will present on diagnosing Parkinson's disease from the street to the bench. I don't know how to pull up the talk, but uh, Professor Lucas, thank you very much for introducing me. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's, uh, it's the, the second. I would like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to be part of this event. It's my, my second turn. I've enjoyed last time very much, and I'm already enjoying uh, this year's meeting as well very, very much. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I like my colleague and close friend, Eduardo Tolosa, I'm also a clinician, and I will follow some of the paths that he has alluded to in his talk um, by reviewing with you the evolution of our concept in what is Parkinson's disease, how we as clinicians diagnose it, and how this will develop. I've called this talk um, as a subtitle, From the Street to the Bench. And some of you may wonder what, what, what that means, and I'll tell you in a, in a second. Before that, doing so, these are my conflicts. None of the conflicts, most of my conflicts are in relation to consultancy with companies involved in drug development for Parkinson's and related disorders. Uh, so none of the mm, topics I'll address today is, is relevant um, in, in relation to these conflicts. I want to cover three things. Um, I'm a professor emeritus like Professor Tolosa, and I cannot do more than three things in one talk, so I've decided to, <laughs> again, focus on these three issues. Um, first of all, to explain the street, I will briefly review the 19th century. Uh, the 19th century was, was a critical time period for clinical neurology. Uh, the method of clinical pathological study and the definition of diseases in neurology took place in the second half of the 19th century. And our leading star uh, on, on that uh, horizon was uh, Jean-Martin Charcot, who taught at the Salpetria in Paris, and everybody interested in the brain at the time was keen to spend time at the Salpetria and listen to his Tuesday lectures. And he presented concepts of disease defined by clinical syndromes, combinations of symptoms, coupled them to post-mortem findings, and coined terms that we've been talking about yesterday, like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, combining the clinical sign of weakness and loss of muscle volume with the pathological finding of corticospinal tract degeneration or multiple sclerosis. This, this was an important time where neurology was born. And the 19th century view is really expressed by James Parkinson's paper, um, the paper that was published, this little monograph, in 1817, more than 200 years ago, and which is the reason why we call the disease, still today, Parkinson's disease, and we've heard about the duck, and I'll come back to that, the single duck of Parkinson's or, or the different ones, but this is how it started, and it was by the way, in brackets, uh, Jean-Martin Charcot, who was the first to suggest to call this disease after James Parkinson because of that monograph. Charcot was very impressed with the precision of the clinical description, and he suggested more than 50 years or about 50 years after that monograph and after James Parkinson's death to call the disease Le Maladie de Parkinson. And what Parkinson had done Basically, he had observed people on the street. 
he had not personally he had not personally examined them but he had seen a pattern of altered movement on the street in Shoreditch in London people that had a bent posture people that made very small steps and were trembling and he thought the bent posture and the small steps were weakness that's why he called the disease a palsy and because it was combined with this tremor which he described in great detail that it was a tremor that was present when the affected body parts were not in motion not actively innovated we call that rest tremor today um, he called this a shaking palsy that was his concept that was all no pathology no investigation and except for this one he saw six people with that syndrome except for one of these six which he regularly saw the others he had just seen once on the street and maybe what he saw was things uh, things like this this is from a uh, a painting that uh, dr lee's found and and put into one of his articles in brain um, this is a contemporary picture of a prison yard at the time of James Parkinson it shows the visiting hours in the prison yard and you see that gentleman maybe that's what James Parkinson saw and other different from other people everybody generations before he thought this was not aging and normal elderly people he thought this was a disease and later on Charcot in his Tuesday lectures when he suggested to call the disease describe the disease to the students and suggested to call it la maladie de Parkinson he, he made this remark I've seen these patients everywhere on the streets of Rome of Amsterdam in Spain it is always the same picture they can be identified from the distance so to speak from afar and you do not even need a medical history or examination and there is some truth in that but of course it's not quite that easy here jumping to more modern times this is a, uh, a summary slide of one paper where the authors reviewed different published clinical pathological series where it had where there was a possibility to match the clinical observation and leading to a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease with a pathological gold standard anchored on nigral cell loss with Lewy bodies etc and when these diagnoses in this meta-analysis were referring to clinical diagnoses made by general neurologists the diagnostic accuracy was suboptimal 74 percent with a range that you can see movement disorder experts were a bit better not greatly so things improved when you follow patients and that's of course a, a trivial wisdom that you get it right the best doctors are, are the last doctors to see the patient after some years and it's easier when you follow patients to be sure but it was still only around a mean of 84% uh, of diagnostic accuracy and using formalized criteria diagnostic criteria didn't really change that very much and and here's the pooled diagnostic accuracy so clearly that's not good enough and there have been efforts like by the international Parkinson's and movement disorder society you commissioned a working group a task force to set out and formulate new well, new is probably the wrong word revised criteria to enhance diagnostic accuracy of a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and there's a validation study of that effort um, this scheme of clinical diagnostic criteria is based on two levels basically a clinically established level where you would have maximum specificity that you really are dealing with the disease you call Parkinson's disease when it comes to post-mortem gold standard and something that would uh, that would be at a price for sensitivity and the other level is clinically probable which would balance sensitivity and specificity issues that was the target and uh, the goal of that of that set of criteria which you can if you're interested or if you don't know it already you can can read now in this in this validation study which was not a post-mortem 
study. So it was not the, the ultimate test. It was ticking criteria, going through criteria in patients and having an experienced movement disorder specialist as the gold standard. And using that kind of approach in, in this cohort of subjects with 430 something Parkinson's and close to 200 non-Parkinson, um, like PSP or, or tremor disorders or MSA, the sensitivity was high of the criteria, but the specificity was less than 90%, and the accuracy was around 90%, which is better than what I showed you from this uh, diagnostic, from this meta-analysis, but this was not clinical pathological. Now, if you look at the criteria they did uh, for clinically established, the sensitivity was far down, but the specificity was up. So this would, these would be good criteria for clinical trials, um, but there is, of course, for clinical trials for disease modification when you want to be sure it's really Parkinson's disease, but then you're still left with the dilemma that um, Eduardo Tolosa alluded to. We approach our patients in these criteria and in, in our daily clinical practice by first making a clinical diagnosis of a Parkinsonian syndrome defined by the core motor features with some supportive clinical signs, the absence of exclusionary signs, that's, that's what we do. But then, as we've heard, there are clinical subtypes of, of this, even inside the core of Parkinson's disease, of what would turn out to be Parkinson's disease, even at post-mortem with assessment. And there are different ways of, that have been used to subclassify clinically these subtypes, but we, we, we don't have firm anchors for those. What is tremor dominant? How, how, what, what is dominance? And someone who starts without tremor but develops it later versus someone who starts with tremor but becomes severely bradykinetic two years later. There, there are issues with these subtypings. Then we have, on the opposite, firmly anchored biologically firmly anchored subtypes like monogenic Parkinson's disease. We've heard about LARC2 or there are other genes, rare genes like synuclein gene mutations. We have recessive genes which were not as uncommon in young onset patients and we have the common risk gene of GBA. These, these subtypes of Parkinson's disease defined clinically we can anchor on biology and of course we can be successful to some extent also to be separating Parkinson's disease from PD mimics. But this also has to be achieved with diagnostic frameworks in which we operate. And then there is this big area that uh, Eduardo Tolosa alluded to. There are people in the population who have an increased risk for Parkinson's disease. Um, some of them might be considered like the LARC2 gene mutation carriers, for example, as preclinical individuals at a stage of disease that's not causing any symptoms, but it's already a diseased nervous system or brain, or someone with unspecific prodromal symptoms, as Toulouse has alluded to. And in order to, to get handles on that, we, we need to use, we need to use to use biological anchors and biomarkers. And I want to address or give you examples of where we are moving uh, in, in the imaging field to achieve better diagnostic accuracy, maybe subtyping, maybe early diagnosis, and also how we can use molecular markers on biofluids or tissues clinically with patients to optimize and get out of some of these problems that we currently have with our clinically defined criteria of diagnosing Parkinson's disease with the aim to better characterize subtypes, to identify preclinical or prodromal stages and exclude mimics. Um, let me start with the imaging. And of course, I will not be able in, in this talk to review all of the imaging approaches that are being pursued. I will touch upon MRI and I'll come back to Radio Tracer at the very end of my talk, but I'll leave it out here. Um, just focus a little bit on MRI. That's a, 
widely available routine technique and that has a very significant role in diagnosing Parkinson's disease, which I'm convinced will grow. Uh, on, this, on this image, you see two examples of MRI studies that are directly addressing substantia nigra changes. Um, this is not all that, and I will come back to those examples, this is not all that MRI can do in Parkinson's disease. Uh, different MRI uh, contrasts and, and algorithms that can be used to study tissue integrity, particularly using diff diffusion tensor imaging, and that is helpful in differentiating Parkinson's disease from lookalikes like multiple system atrophy or progressive supranuclear palsy and automated volumetric measures have the same capacity to help with differentiating true Parkinson's from mimics. Um, I want to focus on studies with MRI or highlight studies with MRI that are directly addressing nigral, nigral pathology. And, and one of those approaches is with neuromelanin imaging with MRI, and that has become possible or is based on the paramagnetic properties of neuromelanin in the substantia nigra, but by the way, also in the locus ceruleus area. And there are high resolution spin echo T1 weighted images that are sensitive to neuromelanin and depict, as on this slide from this paper, the substantia nigra as a high signal intensity area. And one can try and quantify the area of this high intensity contrast and differentiate and, and look at the diagnostic performance of this versus controls. And that, that has been performed in a number of studies. And just to mention, I'll come back to that topic, um, this has also been looked at at putative prodromal non-Parkinson conditions, pre-Parkinson conditions like REM sleep behavior disorder. Now, in summary, with using these methods, this is another meta-analysis slide of 10 studies that have used neuromelanin imaging in numbers of PD patients and healthy controls, looking at the signal intensity of neuromelanin image and the area and the volume of high intensity or uh, high signal. This was the sensitivity and specificity. So it's not bad, uh, but probably not, not good enough, except that we don't know whether it might be a good marker in combination with clinical prodromal signs of potential pre clinical Parkinson's or prodromal Parkinson's. And this is also true, the latter, for another nigral MR contrast that has become of interest in diagnostic use. And this is a peculiar contrast that was first shown on very high field, very seven Tesla, very strong high field uh, MRI imaging um, by the group in Nottingham um, years back when they pointed out that in normal individuals using high resolution um, MR, seven, T, seven Tesla MRI, they, they showed an area within the uh, black background of hypo intense substantia nigra that was an ovoid shaped signal hyper intensity area. They called this, well, you might say maybe a bit prematurely, um, an area that would correspond to a sub-region of the substantia nigra that was delineated as nigrosome 1, an area that many, many years ago was shown um, by Anne Grable and um, Philippe Damier in France uh, to be the area of the nigra with the heaviest damage or initial damage um, or to cells. Whether that area really is one-to-one -one nigrosome one, I, I don't know, I don't think we know, but let's call it there is an area of dorsal nigral hyperintensity in normal people. And what the Nottingham group had shown, this, this signal is lost, at least unilaterally, in most people with Parkinson's disease. And when we 
then went on to perform this because not everyone has a C7 Tesla MRI in his hospital. It's, it's a research tool, basically. But using sequences on MRI that are sensitive to um, iron, and you could also see the same on the conventional three Tesla MRI. And pooling our own and all the other studies in this paper, the sensitivity and specificity of loss of dorsal nigral hyperintensity to distinguish between Parkinson's disease and healthy controls was very good. The problem is this is not a marker that can tell you whether someone has another problem of the substantia nigra, maybe multiple system atrophy. So that's not what it can do. What it can do, though, uh, I believe, it can show early changes, early alterations in the substantia nigra. This is from a study we did in a smallish group of, of patients with REM sleep behavior disorder, again, revisiting the topic of prodromal Parkinson's disease. And uh, you see 90 PD versus a small group of idiopathic REM sleep behavior disorder subjects who are at risk to develop Parkinson's and healthy controls. And the loss of this signal was found in more than 70% of this small group of RBD patients. So this points to the fact that this may be an early marker for nigral dysfunction, which one might use in diagnosing prodromal Parkinson's disease. There's another paper that found had similar results, but the percentages, if you look at that, uh, of RBD subjects with that loss was much lower. This was a larger group of um, 46 individuals with RBD that were included in this study. But again, it's the same direction of a finding and this makes it an interesting marker to, to study for early phases of Parkinson's disease. Where most of the hope for early diagnosis uh, I think currently rests is on, on molecular markers and particularly those related to alpha-synuclein. And I want to s just show you a few uh, findings related to this. The, the, the early efforts after it in 1997 had become apparent that Parkinson's disease, that not only the rare genetic mutations of the synuclein gene cause Parkinson's, but that synuclein is a major component of Lewy bodies through the work of Michel Gerdert and Maria Spilantini. And after that, of course, there, was, there were efforts to try and, and, and measure synuclein and find changes, and this has been not very, the results of that have not really advanced the field of diagnosis, although the, when people measured total synuclein, the CSF of Parkinson patients, they found a trend of this to be lower than in controlled populations, but there was overlap. So at the individual level, it was not a good marker. And then there were efforts to be more specific about the, the pathological species, oligomeric or polymeric alpha-synuclein species, to detect those. Um, and they were higher in Parkinson's, and there was maybe a bit of a better performance, but still there was this issue of overlap. And uh, where things have changed, and this is something that Eduardo uh, uh, Tolosa alluded to, is uh, the use of assays that were originally developed in the prion field and are now standard in diagnosing Jakob Kreutzfeld disease, where um, assays uh, detect the amyloidogenic potential of a protein by using the seeding capacity of a probe if it contains the pathological confirmation of the target protein, in our case uh, Parkinson's synuclein, and a recombinant physiological version of that, and through many cycles of elongation where the probe, if it is positive for the amyloidogenic protein, would induce the confirmation on the recombinant, and there would be multiple steps of sonification and uh, amplification, in the end you would end up with a signal for these proteins, these pathological aggregates being formed. And that has been surprisingly um, good in terms of diagnostic performance when investigated <coughs> investigators used RT-Quick or sometimes PMCA. In Parkinson's disease, patients samples from the CSF versus control subjects. 
all these studies, and I'm not claiming these are all that were published, but there are quite a few that, that are on the slide, all these studies had good sensitivity and some of them had very high specificity in distinguishing Parkinson's from controls. And what is, I think, important to note as a side note, um, some studies, and there are more out now, claim that there is a way with these seeding assays, aggregation seeding assays, to also distinguish different types of synuclinopathies like Parkinson's from MSA. And that, of course, makes it very interesting. Um, and what makes it also very interesting is the potential of these assays to detect disease stages early, like here in the RBD study that Eduardo Tolosa and Hiranzo and colleagues in Barcelona performed, showing RT-quick positivity in a majority of their patients with idiopathic REM sleep behavior disorder in the CSF. And this has not always been uh, replicated in terms of this, you know, almost 100% uh, sensitivity. This is a more recent study using a similar approach where the RBD positivity for this was still above 60%. So it's a very interesting marker, although in this study it was not correlated with phenoconversion and this has to be, has to be studied further. There, there are interesting approaches to look at tissues and how that will work. CSF sampling is not necessarily pleasant. Colonoscopy isn't either. Parotid gland biopsies are not, but skin punch biopsies are very non-invasive. And they have been addressed as with these aggregation assays and studies that were published are very promising in terms of the sensitivity and specificity of detecting pathological synuclein seeding activity in skin biopsies from patients with Parkinson's. And we became interested through works of our colleague Gianluigi Zanusso in Verona, who is a Prion investigator, who years back started to look at Jakob Kreuzfeld disease by sampling the olfactory mucosa, which contains neurons and which is, of course, a site that is being discussed as a site of entry or start of pathology in Parkinson's, um, um, with nasal swabs, another very non-invasive procedure, and then using RT-quick seeding aggregation assay on, on nasal mucosa. And we found in our first study here that it wasn't extremely sensitive. You see that only about 46% of Parkinson's patients had positive arctic quick on the olfactory mucosa, but RBD patients had similar rates of positivity, and there have been papers out now where this sensitivity has gone up for Parkinson's disease in other studies to more 70%. There's one study finding a sensitivity of 80%. It may even be higher in MSA, at least in the MSA Parkinson subtype. So here's another interesting non-invasive molecular approach to diagnose Parkinson's disease. And coming back to imaging, um, at the re most recent Alzheimer Parkinson meeting in Barcelona this year, uh, this group uh, in collaboration, this was a group from uh, Lund University in Sweden in collaboration with AC Immune, tested a tracer for synuclein and had results for another synuclinopathy, MSA, showing distinction of MSA from controls using this synuclein tracer. So we, we see the door opening where synuclein markers might enter the stage of molecular imaging. Parkinson's, by the way, in that, in that uh, presentation, I took the slide from, from the presentation on the website of IC Immune, Parkinson's disease didn't show up that well, which is something not understood yet. Now, in finishing, I would like to come back to the Tolosa duck. Uh, what would be the, the biological future definition for Parkinson's disease? And I think it's, my, my expectation is that we would be moving to a clinical marker-based definition which would be supplemented by data from imaging, and I've shown a few examples, and there may be other tools coming, and molecular markers, and I've shown only 
some uh, examples for, for the nuclein aggregation assays. And we might use that framework in future to address and classify people who would maybe have a positive molecular biomarker as a preclinical type, and we might be further able to subtype those, or we might, with um, prodromal markers or imaging markers, anchor prodromal PD and subtype that, and then the stages of Parkinson's disease. And all that would lead on to a possibility at the preclinical and prodromal level to screen the population. And that has been done and initiated in studies like in the UK using these clinical markers. And I'm finishing, this is the last one. Um, and then using additional tests to arrive at Parkinson's disease risk and prediction of who in the population with a certain prodromal marker profile assessed with further tests would then progress to Parkinson. There are a number of studies and what Professor Tolosa alluded to, the prodromal part of PPMI will do that. And we're doing a joint study together with Barcelona and German centers to try and do that. And that is my conclusion. We will, and that I cannot say other than as a clinician that Parkinson will remain anchored on clinical examination, but then this duck will have to be subspecified, and that's where the imaging and the genetics and other molecular biomarkers will help us, and the pathogenetic subtypes will be able to delineate with that approach, and also the prodromal stages of PD, they are key, as we've heard, for disease-modifying therapies. And population-based screening is, is a realistic scenario, which I think will be further advanced in the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Werner. Unfortunately, we run out of time. Since we, since we are in the lunch break time, maybe we have time for a quick question. Any quick question in the audience? I think people are willing to go for, for the lunch. Uh, before you leave, uh, I think there is going to be a slide with an announcement I heard. I don't, I don't know the details, but... Sorry. 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 I had the 1.30 time. Sí, sí. Los miembros del comité de dirección, por favor, acercaros un momento que vamos a comentar una cosa. Los que estéis...